All right. So as, as I was starting to say, we're in the midst of a lecture series, and this is on what digital technology and social media are doing to us, in particular our politics, our public communication, our social relations, but also our personalities and our understanding of the world, our, our knowledge, if you will. And um, I, I want to give you a, a little bit of a sense of where I'm going. And, and I already spoke with you about this uh, massive book that I'm, I'm drawing on, which is by Shoshana Zuboff and called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, The Fight for a Human Future at the New Frontier of Power. Um, and you probably saw, I referred to this last week, that in, in the Sunday New York Times, uh, Shoshana Zuboff had a, a, a long, and when I say long, it was two full newspaper pages with the, you know, a, a big cartoon, but a, a, a lot of text on the knowledge coup. And in a sense, Zuboff suggests in that article that what happened on January 6, 2021 is the fruits of the seeds that were planted 40, 50 years ago with, with, with the technological revolution and that we live in an age of epistemic anarchy, right? Where, where, where there's no regulation of knowledge whatsoever and that the result of the chaos in the sphere of knowledge is that disinformation can take hold and ultimately motivate a significant fraction of the people around us to believe clearly false but also democratically damaging things like that the election that just transpired is somehow in question a, a about its outcomes, right? And and in a sense, what Zuboff helps us to do, it's not her alone, but I think she, she's, she's done a lot of really good work here, is to look under the hood at the engine that is generating the epistemic anarchy that we are living with. And, and, and so that's where we're going. And, and when I say the engine, that's a metaphor. What I'm really talking about primarily is the algorithmic structure of the applications that we refer to as social media, which of course are computer applications. And when I speak of algorithmic architecture, what I'm talking about is how they're designed. And, and, and so if you open Facebook, right, you are presented with a stream of postings from your friends, but also from various other entities. And, and, and those postings may appear that they just show up there in some kind of random order, but the order is far from random. The order is deliberately curated or engineered in order to uh, do various things, among other things, to maintain your interest both in the immediate moment and in the long term on that application. And, and so the architecture of the app, the algorithm is what determines what shows up when you open that app. And, and to be clear, this is individualized, right? In, in, in the very precise sense of that word, what shows up in your app is different from what shows up in my app based in part on who we know, but also on what the app has learned about us. And, and, and so this is, then uh, important to what's generating the knowledge chaos that we're living with and its effects on our politics and society. And, and so that's where we're going. We're, we're not quite there yet. And I wanna explain why uh, I'm spending a little while longer on what social media is doing to our brains, uh, on um, our psychology, our cognition, in order to get to our public communication. And that is because, um, let, let me put it this way, right? When we spoke together a, a week and two weeks ago about Neil Postman's 
work on technopoly and this idea that there have been three stages of human civilization when viewed uh, from the perspective of the relationship between culture and technology, where the first phase we used our technology according to the standards generated by our culture, our religion, our ethics, our worldview, our psychology. And, and that was because the pace of technological change was so slow and the cultural resources so rich that it was possible to use those cultural resources to regulate or even to disallow certain uses of technology. And it's also because we were in economies that weren't driven by constant technological innovation. And, and so it was not economically self-destructive to culturally regulate our technology, right? That's phase one. Phase two is what uh, Postman calls technocracy. And, and, and that's where the, the pace of technological change, the significance of technology to the economy is such that culture begins to lose its hold, its capacity to determine how and when technology is going to be used. And there's a kind of um, standoff, a kind of give and take or a kind of dialectic in which culture wins some battles, technology wins other battles. Uh, and, and that's a second stage, a kind of transitional stage between a technology using culture and what we're now in now, according to Postman, which is a technopoly. And, and that is where essentially technology has achieved monopoly power in our civilization. We have abandoned even the idea of regulating the use of our technology. And that is what Shoshana Zuboff is talking about in her article. We have to push back and, and, and much more greater length in her book. Uh, and and um, what I wanna do before we get to Zuboff and the political economy of technology is just spend a little bit more time thinking about what technopoly is doing to us. And the reason to do that is because in a sense, when Postman detected this transition occurring in the last decades of the 20th century, he didn't yet actually live with its consequences. And I think in a sense, therefore, he outlined it without being able to fill in the details. We are now in a place where we can fill in the details, right? And, 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 and so that is uh, a little bit of what I want to do today uh, to, to review briefly, right? We had been using Sherry Turkles alone together in order to talk about the categories of psychology that we need to understand what technology is doing us. And I, I want to continue that work, but also to think about why we are using social media to such an extent, why we have surrendered so much of our time and so much of our lives, our energy to this technology. And the pandemic is an answer, but it's not the only answer. And, and, and this is because in part, this trend far predated the pandemic, right? And, and, and so um, figuring out the other factors that are driving us uh, into the embrace, uh, you might call it the cold technological embrace of social media, is I think worth figuring out. And then figuring out how these technologies are reconstituting our subjectivity. Let me break out for just a moment. Yeah, I, I, I just, I, I like this book. I especially like the title of this book. So this is uh, Sven Burke, of, I'm sorry, uh, Sven Burkitz, a uh, professor at, at, at Harvard, a very interesting cultural critic, and his uh, now not quite so recent book on technology is called Changing the Subject, and, and it's arts and aesthetic, art and attention in the internet age, sorry. Um, and, and, and so the idea that we are being changed, our subjectivity is being changed by technology 
is what I like about the title of that book. Uh, and, and so that's where we're going and looking at the transformation of society also as a result of the transformation of self. And then finally, attention and political communication. Just a little bit to talk about today, right? Uh, and, and, and so to refresh your memory, uh, I'm gonna keep boiling this down. What I uh, particularly call your attention to is the amount of time that we now spend on social media. And, and these are averages for Americans in 2018. As you can see, it was more than six hours a day, which is more than double what it was a decade before, which is around a third, maybe a little bit more than a third of waking hours. And of course, we spend some of that time eating and some of that time uh, driving, et cetera. This is probably the dominant activity in many Americans' lives and many people in the developed world's lives at this point. We have, as a result, crowded out a lot of other activities. And that this is particularly pronounced for young people who are in their psychologically formative years. And again, when we compare uh, 2012 and 2018, we see a, an, an absolute doubling of the uh, people who spend, the, the children who spend uh, a considerable amount of time on social media and electronic devices, including roughly 16%, I would guess now it's over 20%, uh, almost constantly, another roughly third who are on their devices hourly. And, and so this is a huge amount of time for all of us and especially for younger people and it is changing us. Um, one of the people who helps us to understand the ways in which it's changing, changing us is Terry Turkle, who teaches at MIT and is an anthropologist of technology with a strong background in psychology. And I think that makes her particularly insightful in thinking about the effects on the individual and on what uh, she and I would call intersubjective activity, the, the, the interpersonal realm of relations, the texture of our relations with each other is being changed by this technology. And as I pointed out to you, she's moved from being a techno-optimist, someone who believes that technology is psychologically beneficial, to being much more a techno-pessimist, who is more concerned about the damaging effects. And I believe if she were to account for that transition, she might say, it's not just that her view has changed, it's that the technology itself has changed. It has gone from being planted on a desk such that if you wanted to do anything else in life, you had to walk away from it, to being ubiquitous, constantly in literally the palm of our hand. Right, and, and, and so uh, that, that transition to microcomputing and handheld computing devices, the internet of everything as we now call it, right? Uh, that is um, driving her challenge to us to, 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 to break the grip of this technology in order to reclaim or rescue conversation and other aspects of face-to-face -face sociability. And if you remember, this is where we left off last week, we were walking through the categories that she gives us to think through uh, psychologically what we lose when mediated interaction displaces face-to-face -face interaction, when we spend more time curating our online presentation of ourselves or as opposed to that, relating to other people, but doing it in uh, the realm of social media instead of the realm of actual human interaction, we, we lose um, a whole bunch of 
different opportunities, opportunities to learn from getting to see the embodied dimensions of human emotion and intelligence, getting to see on the face and in the eyes or the carriage of the individual we're interacting with, how what we're saying is affecting them, right? And, 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 and that is something that's completely lost when you are just characters on a screen to me. Um, and the, to, to put a, a kind of bumper sticker version out there, I, I think you might say that Turkel is saying, what makes human interaction hard is also what makes it rewarding, what makes it stimulating, what it makes, makes it an opportunity to grow and learn from and with each other. And so there's a big emphasis on alterity or difference. When we encounter the alter ego, we may be tempted to simply project ourselves onto them. You must look at the world the way I do. You must have the same range of emotions I do. But if we're actually open to and respectful and engaged in our dealing with them, if we approximate the ideal of an I-thou relationship, right? Really say, I, I don't just want to impose my understanding of you on you. I want you to reveal to me how you understand yourself. Then we are going to very quickly come up against the idea, the, the, the fact, the experience, that others are different from us and that getting to know them, becoming related to them, getting to be friends or being able to treat them as significant others leads us to have to see the world as best we can from their point of view and recognize that that doesn't always coincide with our way of looking at things. And, and, and that is, Turkle thinks, crowded out by what social media do. They, they, they truncate communication. They eliminate the face-to-face -face aspect of it. They, they discourage uh, open-ended questions. And, and, and so we are losing some of the core building blocks of human psychological development, learning, growth when we use these devices to the extent that we're using them. So, so now let's dive into exactly um, what is leading us, nevertheless, to use these devices so much. And I, I'm, I'm going to start um, with uh, a, a, a basic question here. Amy, are you able to Thank you so much. Awesome. Okay. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye. 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 Okay. I, I, I went ahead and, and muted everyone in the background just because we were obviously getting a little bit of background noise there. And uh, as always, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question at any moment. I'm not in any way trying to silence you other than to keep the background noise out of the, the lecture. So, so the question here is, right, you, we were before the pandemic, and, and remember that the, the diagrams I'm showing you about technology use, these all predate the pandemic. I'm sure when we get the data for 2020, what we're gonna see is, is that it didn't just go up another step, right? It probably went up a big jump in, in terms of the amount of time we're spending online, in part because kids now have to go to school online. We have to go to work online. If we wanna have Thanksgiving dinner with our uh, relatives and we're being responsible, we're doing that online, right? And, and, and so the time has gone up, but that predated the pandemic. And so what were the factors that were driving this already? And, and so I'm gonna start with this concept of human fatigue. And, and again, I know I've spoken with you about some of this before. I hope you'll bear with me. I'm setting us up for new stuff, but I wanna, uh, it's, as we were saying at the outset, we've been 
talking about this stuff together for five years, it's not all, I suppose, at the top of everybody's mind. And, and so one of the concepts that Turkle introduces is human fatigue. And I think this is, is very interesting. She, in a sense, suggests precisely because what makes interpersonal interaction valuable is what makes it hard, that we've got to have the energy, the resources, the patience, the time to do this well, right? And, and, and that if we are fatigued, we might prefer paths that allow us less arduous forms of interaction. And, and that social media, in a sense, are there now as an alternative they weren't there in the past, right? And, and, and the fact that they're there give us that choice. And if we are also, in a sense, already fatigued, then that might help to account for some of the move into social media with our available leisure time. And, and, and so uh, Turkle, in explaining this, prefers uh, cultural explanations. Uh, these are explanations about changing norms. And, and, and so I pointed out to you already uh, the, this idea that when I talk to my college students about well, how they communicate with their roommates, they tend to say that they consider it to be an invasion of the privacy or the personal space of the people that they are sharing their dorm rooms with to go knock on their door or ask them a question. By the way, one of the things that I, I think is worthwhile noting is that with younger people today, oftentimes they've got earbuds in all the time, right? And, and, and so uh, even if you were to say, excuse me, you, you, you might not be heard until you manage to break their vision field to get their attention, right? Um, and, and so um, the etiquette that these young people tell us is, is not to interact directly with someone. You've got a question for them, what was the homework and economics last night, right? Uh, as opposed to that, uh, to text them, right? That that's considered more respectful, more appropriate, less invasive. And, and so our cultural norms have changed. And, and another way to put this would be to think about um, how you appear and present yourself in person as opposed to how you appear and present yourself online. And, and the idea that um, maybe at this point, the online presentation is more important than the in-person presentation. There's this, this trend, which I, I find quite distressing, of people seeking aesthetic medicine, Botox and fillers or plastic surgery, because they want to look in person the way they have made themselves look online using so-called filters, right? The various uh, algorithms or technology that allows you to cover up your blemishes and your wrinkles and enhance the glow in your skin. And then you gotta go out in the world and meet the people who saw you online, uh-oh, I better fix my face so that my real face looks the way that my digitally curated avatar looks, right? And, and, and so this would all be cultural explanations, right? That, that we prefer to present ourselves online than doing it in person, or new norms of etiquette have grown up that suggest that online communication or uh, social media communication is more important than in-person stuff. I want to also emphasize social explanations. And, and, and some of this would have to do with the transformation in the economy that has occurred in more or less exactly the same time that the social media and digital computing revolutions have occurred. As a matter of fact, those revolutions drove some of the changes in the economy. But we've shifted into a service economy right, away from a manufacturing economy. That's not a complete and thorough transition, but more and more people work face-to-face -face with other people in fairly superficial relations, right? You, you, you smile and you take somebody's money, you ring up their order, you show them to their 
<laughs> table, et cetera, right? But you, you, you make a shot of espresso for them. But nevertheless, you are spending an awful lot of your time face to face with other people, interacting with them, and in a sense, needing to be presentable, needing to be polite, needing to, to be affable in the way in which you interact and relate with them. And that might leave less time and energy for you to then want to go be with people again uh, in your leisure time. Not only that, if we look at these service sector jobs in ways that we've talked about before, we know that many of them are both uh, unstable uh, in terms of their hours, and, and so that makes it harder to schedule stable social activities, but also that they are incredibly precarious jobs. That is to say that they don't pay you a lot and that many people who do them find they need to get a second or a third job to make ends meet. And if you are, for instance, driving an Uber uh, 10 hours a day, you may literally not have the energy at the end of the day to then spend a lot of time in a relatively demanding interpersonal relationship. And so human fatigue may come out of changes in our economy or our society as well as out of changes in our culture. And, and related to this is the transformation of work and what I'm, I'm drawing on the contemporary political economist and feminist philosopher Nancy Fraser calls the production-reproduction border. And we've moved away in, from the middle of the 20th century when um, most people who did primary care for dependent others, and, and, and I'm using the big category that includes parenting, or to use the gendered term, mothering, as well as caring for a spouse, or caring for parents, or caring for in-laws, right? Everybody who needs care, we tended to have people, primarily women, almost exclusively women, whose full-time work was to do that. And, 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 and the result was, and, and they did it for the people they were directly related to, right? That, that in a sense, there was sufficient time, energy, resources available to do this interpersonal labor directly and in a dedicated way where the person doing it was someone who you had or would have a lifelong relationship with, right? And, and that meant that there was a kind of organization of the family and of society that allowed for this kind of work to be direct and face-to-face uh, -face and interpersonal. And, and Nancy Fraser points out that in the 21st century, uh, maybe going back to the 1990s, this, this border shifted to the point where essentially a one income family no longer worked for the vast majority of Americans. And so women came into the workforce. Of course, many women wanted to do that and, and found it liberating to do it. But what happened to all the care labor that they were doing? And as Fraser points out, it gets in a sense outs outsourced. And, and depending on who you're talking about, whether the, the, the young children go to an aunt or a grandparent's house or to a daycare center or have a nanny, it's a different relationship. It may often be a less directly personal relationship not necessarily a relationship with a significant other, right? And, 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 and so part of maybe what's pushing us uh, into increased use in social media, and I'll just sketch the scenario for you for a moment, you're a working mother. You send your child to a daycare center after school because you have to stay at work to be able to pay the bills, right? And you give your child a phone, and when you've got 10 minutes to spare at work, you FaceTime your child, right? You, you have a, a video phone conversation with them. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? It makes sense that you would want to connect to your child. But now what is happening is that a face-to-face -face interaction has been displaced by a social media interaction. So again, transformations in, in work, 
have changed our use of technology. Um, another factor here, and, and these next two factors are, are strongly emphasized by Robert Putnam, whose work Bowling Alone I've spoken with you about in the past. And um, Putnam, and he's certainly not alone, emphasizes that we have become a much more mobile society, geographically speaking, over the last 50, 60, 70 years. And so the average American worker moves seven times over the course of their career. And usually two of those moves are interstate moves. So you're not just moving uh, in the same community to get a nicer house. You're moving to an altogether new city or state in order to get a new job, right? And, and, and the result of that is on the one hand, we have an attenuated relationship to our geographic community. We have only recently arrived there. We may anticipate that we're not staying there that long. We don't put down roots and building face-to-face -face communities requires that kind of stability and depth of commitment. Similarly, suburbanization, which happened in the 50s and 60s in this country in a very accelerated way, um, means that we live in less geographically dense communities. We rely on our cars more. And that means that we're less well acquainted with our neighbors who we may suspect will be moving on or will be moving on uh, soon. Uh, at one of the, the, the byproducts of, of, of the pandemic and everybody uh, staying out of the gyms and using walking as their exercise instead is that people are starting to get to know their neighbors a little bit, which, which might seem strange from a historical perspective. Of course, you know your neighbor, not so much in 21st century America. Civic privatism is another factor that Robert Putnam refers to, and he, he's drawing ultimately on Alexis de Tocqueville's work here, and his sense is that with the revolution in television technology, and this idea that every home has a color TV, um, a new kind of use of leisure time became possible. And that was a much more private and isolating use of leisure time, right? We can just sit in our own rooms, our living rooms, with our loved ones, our kids, our spouse, and uh, see what's on the TV, right? And, 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 and it used to be, prior to television and radio and movies, that if you wanted to do something interesting with your leisure time, often it meant you had to get out of the house and interact with other people, right? And, and Putnam famously documents the decline of bowling leagues in America, right? The idea that we used to have the time, the energy, and a sense, the need to get out of the house in such a way that for a long time we supported bowling with strangers. Now we're much more likely to sit at home and watch Game of Thrones than go out and bowl with people we don't know. Um, next factor. These are all factors that in a sense are driving us into social media and away from face-to-face -face interaction is the intensification of the demands of care or for care. And I'll start with this idea of concerted cultivation. Uh, this idea that those of us who are in the middle class or upper middle class have come to the conclusion that as we raise our children, it's not enough to love them, feed them, and leave them alone, in Dr. Spock's famous words. In, in Annette LaRose's account, which I've spoken with you about before, as opposed to that, we really need to, to spend a fair bit of time speaking with them, playing with them, but also taking them to soccer games and soccer practices and lessons and violin lessons and recitals and to tutors, et cetera. And that if we don't spend all of this time and energy and money on our children, 
they're not going to get into the kind of college that's going to open the kind of economic opportunities we want to have for them. At the same time, people are living longer. And I hardly need to say this to you, as we live longer, sometimes we have greater needs or demands for care, right? And, and, and for those of us who are lucky enough to be in good retirement communities that provide some of this care for us, it doesn't necessarily fall as heavily on the shoulders of our children. But for many people, it's actually the kids, the adult kids who take care of their aging parents and relatives. And this also intensifies the demands for care, right? And, and, and so we refer to the sandwich generation, the generation simultaneously taking care of their kids who need a lot of care and their parents who may need a lot of care and they're kind of squoze in the middle, right? That that, that, that is um, a fact of uh, 21st century life. And, and that is also producing human fatigue. If, if you're spending an awful lot of time running your kids around lesson to lesson, practice to practice, and then going to your parents' house to help them fix something or make a meal or get to the doctors, it kind of makes sense that when you get to the amount of time you have left for yourself, you might just want to uh, veg out with Netflix on your phone in the bathroom. Right, and then just leave me alone. This is me time, right? And, and, and again, this is driving us into digital technology and apart and away from each other. Um, when we then add to this, and, and I'll just mention this briefly, the fact that it's frankly, when we look at those who are doing care labor, when we look at those who are doing the double shift uh, on the one hand, going into the workforce, on the other hand, still trying to take care of things at home. Um, this is not fairly distributed, right? And, and we can talk about this at the level of the family, that men and women don't do the same share of this labor, but we can also talk about this at the level of society. You've, you've probably seen the quote in the, the news, Sunday Times has this whole section, which I obviously have not had time to look at yet, the primal scream, right? But uh, America's mothers are in crisis, right? And, and, and this is about the fact that in a sense, as, as one quotation puts it, other societies have a welfare state, America has women. That when kids have been kicked out of school because of the coronavirus, right? Not able to attend physically, why is it that 1.7 million women have dropped out of the labor force? It's because it falls to them to care for their kids when schools are closed. If we were more just, not just within the particular family, but as a society in making childcare and other forms of support available, then there might not only be more women participating in the labor force, more equality in wages, but also more time and energy for interpersonal relations. And so then once we, we pull all those factors together and we note the ease and availability of digital and social media alternatives, uh, it's really not very surprising that many of us are in fact using this technology to the degree that we are using it. And then of course, the pandemic comes along and accelerates these trends. And one of the big questions as, as the vaccine begins to emerge, and let's hope we begin to come out from under the cloud of the coronavirus, is how much of, of, of the way in which the pandemic drove us even further into the embrace of digital technology and social media, how much of that is gonna actually go away once the pandemic goes away? And how much of it is gonna stay and be permanent, right? And, and we don't know the answer to that, but I, I certainly don't expect we're gonna go back to 2018, 2019 in 2022, right? Some of what has happened either in work or in social relations or in the way in which we date, et cetera, is going to be a lasting change. All right, so now 
what is this doing to us in, in terms of our sense of self and subjectivity? And I'm gonna to try to tick through this list pretty quickly with you. Again, this is material that in certain respects we've spoken about together. Please, if, if you need me to, to slow down and, and elaborate, just ask, and, and I will be totally happy to do it. Um, to begin with, we are having new experiences, right? And, and, and so I imagine many of you had your first ever Zoom holiday gathering at, 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 at some point last year. I just did my first Zoom memorial service, right? And, 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 and that's one kind of experience. Obviously, we're having Zoom classes as well. Um, I'm using Google Duo to communicate with my friends, right? And didn't even know that app existed six months ago. Um, but more deeply still, as I, I've said, that, that for many people who are digital natives, for many people who've grown up their whole lives with this technology, their online presence may be the most important aspect of their social presentation of their self, more important than their face-to-face -face interaction with other people. And I would just point out to you that 40, 50 years ago, this didn't exist, but for a very few celebrities who you could go to the movies or see on TV, right? The, 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 the vast majority of us the only presentation of ourselves to others was direct and face-to-face. -face. Now for a whole generation, generations of people, there are in a sense two selves, the online self and the interperson self, and this is giving rise to a kind of bifurcation of the presentation of selves self to others, right? It's not just that you present yourself to those you know and interact with, you present yourself in online fora to a whole unknown anonymous public of potential viewers, right? And, and so this is giving rise to whole new ways of experiencing the self and whole new forms of sociability. New etiquettes, I've already spoken a little bit about this, but, but let me drill down for a moment, right? Uh, there's this idea that a lot of our communication is now mediated, and a lot of it is now, in fact, text message based. And, and, and so to be clear, or uh, DM, digital me messaging of one kind or another, right? And, 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 and one of the things that Turkle finds, and she's not alone, is that the very nature of the communication changes when the um, medium of, of communication changes. And, and right, Malcolm McCorrin a long time ago said the medium is the message that might be a bit overblown, a bit reductive, but uh, when you have to use your thumbs to type out whatever it is you're saying to somebody else, there's a uh, kind of friction in communication that isn't there in interpersonal communication. And the result is that an implicit range of norms has grown up. The simple illustration of this is the opening question in a conversation. In interpersonal interaction, it's almost always, how are you? or what's going on, or what's up, right? And, 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 and uh, those questions are all open-ended questions. They invite or solicit long textured answers that might reveal a fair bit about the self. When you look at the um, text of digital messaging, what you see is that the opening question is not an open-ended question. It is usually, where are you, right? Uh, at most, what are you doing, right? And, and part of the uh, norm there is, I'm not gonna ask this person who I don't know what they're doing right now, uh, and who only has two thumbs, 
to um, spend an awful lot of time revealing things about themselves. And so in a sense, that question, how are you doing, doesn't get asked as much on these media. And these media are more and more structuring interpersonal interactions. So the etiquettes are again giving rise to new experiences. Uh, substitution, this is very straightforward. Let me elaborate just for a moment. Um, one kind of social science study is the so-called time use study. And it's actually kind of interesting. We ask people to walk around with journals and every 15 minutes just to write, this is what I did for the last 15 minutes, right? And, and, and the, what we get is a very accurate understanding of how the day was used. If, if, if we don't give them the journals and if they're not good about recording it, it tends to be we forget a lot of stuff by the end of the day, right? You, you don't remember that you were brushing your teeth and folding your socks from 8.30 to 8.45 in the morning. Uh, and, and what we see is what in a sense we can infer from these diagrams about time use, which is that our use of these technologies are displacing other activities. And, and, and so, right, we, we get this in part from looking at cell phone use and app use uh, uh, technology. We also get it from these time use surveys. And as you can see, right, the cover of Sherry Turkle's most recent book, Reclaiming Conversation, is two empty chairs. And that represents the findings of these kinds of studies, which is that we are substituting media use for conversation. Conversation has fallen off as a form of human activity in terms of the amount of time that we're spending on it. For many of us, it's gone down by two or three or four hours a day. And again, there are only so many hours in a day. So this means conversation is coming down by 25 to 50% in terms of average amount of time people spend with their days and, 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 and do, do engaged in conversation during their day. And then there's this sense of loss, right? That, that, that what um, we have substituted for is not fully preserved in the new activity. And so when Sherry Turkle titles her influential book, Alone Together, she's noting this irony of the age of social media, which is that we are all more connected to each other. I have a online Passover celebration and my cousin in China, my nephew in Barbados, my cousin in Australia, my family in California and Georgia, we can all be in the same place at the same time on the same screen sharing our stories with each other. Isn't that wonderful? And, and I mean it, I, I, I'm, I'm not saying that in a glib way. But having said that, many of us at the end of the day, nevertheless feel more alone feel more cut off, feel more lonely. And that is because we are substituting one kind of social interaction with another kind of social interaction. And the kind of social interaction that we have replaced had perhaps greater difficulty associated with it. I've got to actually get to know the other in their particularity and specificity and difference from me but also greater rewards associated with it. And so as we replace face-to-face -face interaction with mediated interaction, we have a sense of loss, a sense of loneliness. Um, I will stop there. I, I, I promise you I will come back to this stuff, but I'm cognizant of the time and of the fact that I've been essentially speaking for the whole time we've been together. And I know you guys, I'm sure you have some questions, some thoughts. So I'm gonna unmute everyone. Remember now that your background noise will pick up. You may still have to unmute yourself. Who wants to start us out with a question? Comment, thought.
I will. Wilma. I see you, Wilma. Go ahead. Okay. You were talking about the algorithms and the way it's all structured. Uh, I became aware recently that people have been looking at QAnon, and that seems to be a horse of a different color and a very scary one because it's designed to be addictive. Um, it, 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 people compare it to a video game more than whatever else we do on, online. Uh, and have you looked at that? I understand that there's a network on direct TV called Vice, V-I-C-E, and they did a three-part series on QAnon that really delved into this. And I just wondered if you had looked at that and considered what that is now is doing. Um, yeah, so I have not seen the Vice series on QAnon. I have been doing some reading on QAnon. And I, it, it's funny, Wilma, because let me just say back to you, you started out by saying it, it's a horse of a different color, it's addictive. And, and in a sense, I, I want to dispute that claim, not because I'm not critical of QAnon. I think there's an awful lot to be critical of with QAnon, but because the addictive dimension of social media is not specific to any particular content. And QAnon is really more to do with content than to do with the algorithmic architecture of different media platforms. So are, are you with me? Let, let me try to unpack that for a moment, right? This little thing, right, uh, is, is uh, the conduit for a whole bunch of different applications. And, and uh, I'm trying to, to get it to uh, open. Okay, so, so now you can see, right? I, I, and if I scroll through all those little boxes, each one of them is an application, right? Uh, sorry, let, let, me, let me do it like this. Can I listen? Yeah, uh, do it like this. And um, so, right, you, you can see, yeah, I, I, you, you'll get a little bit of a sense of, of which bank I use, et cetera, if you look at all of my icons. But all those icons are applications, right? And each of those applications is built by particular entrepreneurs. And many of those entrepreneurs, in addition to providing some kind of unique service also are hiring psychologists, behavioral scientists to try to make their application as addictive as possible. And, and in particular, uh, the, the metaphor that's often used here is a slot machine. Right, and, and, and some of you may have had the experience if you've been to Vegas or Tahoe and played the slots, right? That, that it, it's hard to tear yourself away from a slot machine. Just one more pull on the handle and you're bound to hit the big jackpot, right? And, and, and there's, there's actually this um, com fairly complex understanding now of the way in which dopamine <laughs> operates in the human brain. And it is a happiness neurotransmitter and that when we don't know exactly when the reward is going to occur, but there's some likelihood that it's going to occur, that it sets up a kind of dopamine loop in, in, in which we're hungry for the feedback, right? And so that these applications are all designed to suck us in and to have us fall, as they say, down the rabbit hole, right? Using the Alice in Wonderland metaphor where once you get into it, all of a sudden an hour went by, oops, I, I wasn't even paying attention. They're designed to get you sucked in and stay. I don't know. Hold on just a second, hold on. And the reason is um, because they primarily make their money by holding our attention. Right, and, and, and so we're gonna get more deeply into this. And this is true of all of these applications. It's not specific to QAnon. Now, when we get into QAnon, we have to talk about more specific stuff. Like, why is it that people believe in a conspiracy? Uh, and, and, and what are the social preconditions for thinking that your government 
is so deeply corrupt that it's engaged in child uh, sex trafficking? And why is it that you are so desperate for a savior that you believe that Donald Trump, even after he loses the election, is going to somehow miraculously reclaim power in part by eradicating those evil deep state people, right? That's the QAnon content. I think that's different from the algorithmic infrastructure of all of these applications. And yes, QAnon is particularly vicious, particularly problematic, particularly destructive. But frankly, it, the, the, the possibility for it is built into the architecture of apps that are in many ways apparently much more benign. So does that help, Wilma? And, and we'll get deeper into QAnon in, in, in weeks to come. All mm -hmm. right, so, so uh, who, I, I see a couple questions. Donald is, is the name, but that's not Donald. Go ahead, you're gonna have to hold your uh, space bar down. Yeah, I still can't hear you. Uh, give me a second, let me make sure I have unmuted you. Now you need to hold that space bar down. Can you go down to the microphone icon, icon and unmute it that way? Okay, I think we're getting you now, is that right? No. No. I'm gonna let you keep working on it. John had his hand up. I was trying to give somebody else a chance first, but John, go ahead. I... Uh, about QAnon, it's, um, it's, it's also the sort of psychological uh, thing that uh, research has shown that it's people with um, personality problems that are led to QAnon. And then also that, uh, this is from Tom Edsel's op-ed in the Times this Wednesday, a large percentage of people drawn to conspiracy thinking are willing to endorse mutually incompatible conspiracy theories, such as the more participants believe that Osama bin Laden was already dead when U.S. Special Forces raided his compound in Pakistan, the more they believed that he's still alive. Hmm. Yeah, and, and, and so, and, and by the way, this, this is not exclusively people who believe in conspiracy theories. Many of us ha have uh, not too much time maintaining simultaneously incompatible beliefs, right? That, 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 that's not that unusual. Um, but these are beliefs that are being seeded um, in the social media environment for a variety of reasons. Some of them by bad actors who are foreigners who are trying to destabilize American democracy. Some of them by people who just think they can make a buck and the more outrageous thing they say, it turns out the more money they can make. Some of them who are uh, trying to um, bolster the political prospects of Donald Trump or another political candidate, right? And, and so there are multiple ways in which these conspiracy theories are fed once they've been fed they then can really spiral out of control and take on a life of their own and then that is in part what we're seeing with QAnon as well how about face-to-face uh, -face communication now let me look at one thing I, was go ahead. A, I taught in a boarding school and those those uh, young people who are now 75 have been call me now and say what was it that was so much fun one guy started poetry groups in in, in uh, Seattle because he felt that people didn't get a chance to really talk to each other. So if you run into a poetry group in Staten, in Staten Island or something like that. Anyway, and uh, I remember sitting at a table with six women at Wilma's house some years ago. And we were talking about the fact that it was so nice to get rid of the kids for the afternoon so we could talk to each other. And uh, so those are two examples of satisfying communication. Yeah, and it, it's interesting because there is, and, and, and I'll give you an, an illustration of this that I find to be particularly funny and illuminating. The Brooklyn Public Library every year has a philosophy night. And in the philosophy night, the Brooklyn Public Library, the main branch, stays open all night. And they have talks and 
seminars and discussion groups and thousands of people are in the Brooklyn Public Library at three o'clock in the morning talking about philosophy. And, and, and to my mind, part of what this reveals is exactly what you're describing, which is this hunger for interpersonal connection that is in a sense harder and harder to come by in the urban digitized environs of modern cities. And, and, and so, yes, I, I think, you know, whether it's a poetry group, a reading group, a knitting group, right, we're all trying to, in a sense, rebuild what has been crowded out uh, of our uh, everyday life. Uh, well, go the, ahead. The kids that I've talked to afterwards, you know, and, and recent graduates from the school, have said to me, we can't just get it, just can't get a real what's not conversation anymore. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, and and I mean obviously conversation is an art. It takes a certain amount of practice, right? Mm -hmm. Uh so I'm seeing Bob's iPad has a hand up. Go ahead. Um I'm not sure you can hear me because I don't have a space bar to press, but whatever. I do uh, hear you. <laughs> okay, great. Uh just a very general feeling that I have from this lecture is that it's uh, so oriented towards the middle class. We talk a lot about inequity and I'm wondering whether those that are less advantaged have the same issues. Uh, you know, I'm kind of thinking about the black kids on the corner, they're just hanging out and more face to face than uh, through media and whatnot. So I just wonder whether this is somehow inequitable and the people that uh, have more affluent have this problem more than others. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question, Bob. And, and you put me in mind of the book from 20 years ago, Affluenza, right? The, 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 the problems of the affluent who are trying to get their satisfaction through shopping and it turns out that doesn't work out very well. I don't think this is an exclusively high class problem, although obviously it is uh, expensive to have internet access. It is expensive to have a cell phone. It is expensive to have cable TV. And on the other hand, Part of what we see is that there are a lot of people in our society right now who, when push comes to shove, will pay the cell phone bill and forego a few meals a month in order to be able to do so, right? And, and, and there's a sense in which, on the one hand, having a cell phone has just become a absolute material necessity. Right. And, and, and so if you are an Uber driver or working for some other delivery service or want the next hours that become available at the meatpacking plant, you better have a cell phone because your boss is going to text you uh, and tell you where you got to be when. Right. And, and, and so that's not just a high class thing anymore, despite the fact that it's expensive. Right. Um, and we, we, we add to that then the social dimension to this. And again, you may say those kids on the street corner are just hanging out. But what we see is those kids on the street corner also usually have a pretty robust social media presence. Right. And, and so not just for your work, but also for what I'm calling your presentation of self to others, right? Which is, is essential to building our sense of self and to getting social validation for ourselves. That too requires access to these devices. And so uh, based on the research I'm doing, yes, this may be more prevalent. And the, the higher up the income scale you go, but I don't see a floor. I, I, I think this is occurring almost all the way down to the point where people become totally indigent. All right, I, I, I should go. Uh, I've got another lecture coming in 15 minutes. I, I, as always, have so much fun being with you guys. I don't really want to stop, but I do think I better call it a day. 
we will continue next week. And, and I know I promised this before, we will start getting into the political stuff very soon, okay? Take care, everybody. Good luck with those second doses. See you in a week. Bye-bye. Thank you, David. See you. Take Thank care. You guys. Take care. Bye-bye.